Hello and welcome to this Edexcel A-Level Geography Enquiry Question Review. Today we're looking at Water Enquiry Question 3 and how does water insecurity occur and why is it becoming such a global issue for the 21st century? So, as always, we refer first of all to the specification. It's so important to review the specification when you're revising and reviewing your work as it will go through the key terms that you will see in the exam and the key terms you'll be expected to use with your answers. What's also important with inquiry question sit three is we can start to see the synoptic themes that link the whole of the course in terms of futures, the different players and the different actions. And you can also see from the world symbol here, the different types of compulsory case studies and the information that you must try and use, particularly in the assess and evaluate questions. It's important to remember that with the explain questions, it's likely to focus on just one of these areas of detailed content within the key idea. It may sometimes link to, but it's often just one. When we come to assess and evaluate questions, it's linking a number of different things from different key ideas. And it may be linking ideas, key ideas from different inquiry questions as well. So that's how they develop the true understanding of your knowledge and application of geography to the questions. So again, the role of the specification is so important to your revision as we go through. So if we have a quick look at the overview, here we can see the main areas that we're looking at then. So we're looking at water insecurity. What is it? Why is it happening? Yeah. And linking this to the futures. What could be happening in the futures here? We're looking at what are the consequences and the risks of the water insecurity? We'll then look at the actions, the water management. What is and what can be done and what are the different measures there? And then finally, really looking at the synoptic links, looking to the human elements to the course, talking about the geopolitics and the likelihood of conflicts within um, water, which is likely to be the new big thing, particularly with the increasing levels of climate change we're expected to see. So looking at the first section, water insecurity. Yeah. First of all, you need to know the definition. Now, water insecurity is simply a mismatch of supply and demand, where there is too much demand and uh, not enough supply. Now, what they say is water stress is when there is less than 1700 cubic meters per person and scarcity is less than a thousand cubic meters of water per person. So what are the causes of this? Well, very much links back to inquiry questions one and two particularly when we're looking at climate variability. Yeah, when we look at the changes to the global atmospheric circulation, El Nino Southern Oscillations, and various different factors, uh, physical factors there. There is also one of saltwater encroachment, okay, which is can be physical and also linked to human, in that where there is over abstraction, then sometimes salt water can go in to fill in those aquifers. The other way is through climate change, is that as sea levels rise, this will lead to more water, salt water getting into the water tables. There are also human elements of water insecurity, and it's important to realise there are two different sides to this, in that they can directly affect the quality of the water. So although there may be plentiful water around, because of pollution from industry, from agriculture, or from sewage, from domestic use, that can affect the amount of water available to a population. In particular, we've got to think about clean water. So this can be a major issue, particularly in developing and emerging nations, where often economic development comes at an environmental cost because the government do not put uh, enough pressure on the environmental rules. There is obviously also the impact that humans can have on the quantity directly of water, which is mainly from over abstraction, again linked to these three main areas. And it may be due to lack of management or lack of governance. Now, demand is also important. Remember, we talked about supply and demand. 
So here we're looking at the supply side of it. Here we're looking at the demand side of it. With increasing levels of development and increasing level living standards, people are going to want more water. With increasing population, more water is going to be needed for agriculture and for industry, in energy production, in the manufacturing of goods that people are going to want more. OK, so we can see that there are lots of links, lots of different factors which relate to the causes of water insecurity. So what are the consequences and some of the risks of these? Well, first of all, if we look at water scarcity, yeah, and this could be due to physical or to human factors. And it's basically meaning that people don't have access to clean water. First of all, there is physical scarcity. This is where 75% of the water stores or flows are used by the population. Now, this could get worse as population increases, or it could even get worse because of poor management, because of poor agricultural techniques, of irrigation techniques, um, industries um, having too much power and the lack of governance and administrative governance um, to actually put pay to this excessive use. There is also economic scarcity, uh, particularly in developing and emerging nations where there may be plentiful water supplies, but the lack of money um, means that it's impossible to put the infrastructure to get the water to go to who it needs to. The lack of governance may be a problem as well. And also a lack of technology, particularly in getting to things like the water stores or the fossil water stores under the Sahara Desert. Now, this economic scarcity can also link to the pricing of water. And the overarching theme here is it seems water seems to be far more expensive in developing nations, particularly in those areas where it is more scarce. So looking at the supply and demand curve from economics. And pricing can vary due to a number of factors. Obviously, the accessibility. How easy is it to get that water out and then to transport it around? You know, how much water is available? Also, the levels of demand. As demand for something goes up, then the price of it is likely to go up. Uh, again, linked to accessibility and infrastructure is the cost to extract it and transport it around. How much treatment is needed for that water will also have an impact on the pricing, as will governance in some way. In many uh, ways, the World Bank and Monetary Fund uh, will often state in giving loans to poorer nations that water supply should be taken under private ownership. And often these are seen for the profits of these private companies rather than for the public good. And this can often lead to a massive increase in the price that consumers have to pay for water. And Bolivia is a good case study of what happened here and how the people rose up to try and get things changed. It's also important we've got to realise the importance of water for so many different factors. For economic development, it's vital. Without water, you're not going to be able to produce the energy which is going to supply the industry for the manufactured goods, which is going to um, increase level of export and products for the consumer market within the country. The need for water for economic for, uh, development, for agriculture, for increasing food supplies, again, for the local economy, but also for export as well. Human well-being is vital to have water. In terms of sanitation, the clean water, um, which has a big impact on health. Without clean water, health will suffer. This will also then have an impact on economic development if you don't have a fit and available workforce. It can also impact on the education of children as well, because if they're constantly ill, then they won't have as good an education, which will have an impact on economic development. So we can see the supply of clean water should, for human well-being, should be seen as the overarching factor because without well humans, you can't have good, strong economic development. A factor which is often overlooked when things are put into private ownership. So there are many economic, social and environmental issues which are caused by the poor supply and quality of water. So many consequences and risks. So what are the actions? Well, 
similar to coasts, there are hard and soft approaches. The hard approaches are things like water transfer schemes in China, moving it from areas of a country where there's plentiful water supply to where the population is. There are also things like mega dams, particularly in countries like Brazil, where not only are they used for water supply, um, but also for energy as well. Again, the Three Gorges Dam on the Yangtze River in China is also a good case study here. Desalination plants, particularly in the wealthier nations and those with lots of access to fossil fuels, such as the Middle East, will often rely on desalination, taking out the salt of seawater. But this is very um, energy intensive. And you need to be able to descri describe and explain these different processes and where, give examples of them, as well as mentioning the positives and negatives. And the same could be true for soft engineering. This idea that water restoration could be key. The use of planting trees as they not only affect the carbon cycle, but also massively the water cycle, not only as a way of reducing flooding, but also to help store water within the ground. And the same again is true of wetland restoration, helping not only to store water, but also to clean water. Changes in agriculture to things like permaculture, using less chemicals within agriculture, the way that you use the soil, that you don't plough it as often um, to prevent less leaching, can also have a big impact in water management. Now, again, looking at all of these methods and how they can be used sustainably. Yeah? But not only do we need the hard and soft approaches for sustainable water management, we also need to look at things like smart irrigation. Yeah, how can we reduce the losses through evapotranspiration when using it for agriculture? How could we use grey water? So this is the untreated water, maybe storing water that falls from houses to use in flushing toilets, washing cars, watering gardens, rather than clean fresh water for that. But conservation using less water is going to be critical to solving problems in the future. And a really good case study of this is Singapore, a small island nation uh, with a large population, which does have problems with water catchment because the population is so high and it's such a small land area. So although it has high rainfalls because it's in an equatorial climate, um, it's hard to store that. So they've come up with a number of different ways in using um, pipes and drainage under the ground as part of their water catchment using some, but reducing the need for imported water. Um, also looking at water treatment, UV treatment and desalination using these four different ways of trying to increase demand <coughs> uh, supply. But also using education is a key tool to reduce demand. And that is vital to this. So altogether, this links us to the geopolitics. What are the conflicts over water? Now, it's important to realise that conflicts are on a sliding scale from minor conflicts, which might have easy resolutions to major conflicts, which may lead to war. And not all water conflicts will lead to war. Some of them can be easily resolved and they're on different scales, local, regional, right through to transboundary, looking at different countries. And you need to look at some of these key areas, such as the Nile Basin, uh, conflicts between India and Bangladesh um, and the countries within Europe, but also to see that with conflict, there are solutions. Um, the integrated drainage basin management schemes, the water sharing treaties, such as the water frameworks, the Berlin rules, uh, the Helsinki rules on equitable use uh, and equitable and sovereignty of the water. Um, looking at the Nile Basin River Agreement, and the United Nation European Convention for Water. And then we also need to consider the futures. Are conflicts going to be more likely because of climate change leading to possible climate refugees? Population growth, what is that going to look like and what impact is that going to have? Economic development, how is that going to impact on it as people get richer and want more things? And then geopolitics, again, linking to climate change. Are we going to stand together as a one world and work together to solve our problems? Or are we going to become more nationalistic and individualized, thus creating more problems?
So I hope you found this of use. Um, again, many more of these reviews are available to you and keep coming back to them. Many thanks. See you soon. Bye.